Hey everybody, Nick Espinoza, your chief security fanatic here. And today I have an insanely special guest. One, I don't even need to interview, or, or rather I should interview, I should say that. One, I actually really don't need to introduce. And that's what I meant to say here. You can tell I'm a little freaked out and nervous. This is honestly, this is like meeting Santa. I was a kid at Christmas just before this interview. I'm not kidding. But with me today is Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know him as an American astrophysicist, a planetary scientist, an author, a science commentator. He basically runs Hayden. I mean, it, he is fantastic. You've probably seen his TV shows such as Nova back in the day or Cosmos or even Star Talk, which I absolutely love. And he's written a ton of books, The Pluto Files, uh, Space Chronicles, Welcome to the Universe, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit. Um, astrophysics for people in a hurry and a ton of others, uh, you know, not to mention just a whole bunch of other stuff. It, it, it's just awesome. And, and so, so, um, Mr. D Dr. Tyson, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Dr. Neil to you. <laughs> Dr. Neil it is. All right, Dr. Oh, Neil. Fair okay. enough. And, and I'm so, just I'm so. Neil. <laughs> just Neil is fine. Plus I'd like to contrast whatever you'd feel meeting Santa with me and at least say that I'm I'm, I actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, don't tell that to the seven-year-olds uh, okay. you know, in, in the world. I, that's what I was thinking of. Like, just kidding. I exist, but I'm not bringing you presents. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. This is my present for the year. Really, it is. So I, I want to dive in and, and you know, first things first, and I, I really honestly hate to start with a serious question out of the gate, but I know that my listeners are really dying to understand this and really dying to know this. Star Trek or Star Wars? Because Star I know you're- a fan. Uh, Star Trek. Star Trek? All right. Next All right. Question. We can Just now continue this interview. <laughs> now, there's at least some premise of actual science going on in Star Trek. There's at least some thought that went into the physics, the chemistry, the biology, the reasoning, the logic. There's some thread through every episode, and I've yet to find any such corresponding threads in Star Wars. So to me, Star Wars is, is you know, yes, it's a fight between good and evil that happens to take place in space, not because it actually needed to be there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. And and if you couldn't tell by the stuff on the behind me, I'm a Trekkie myself. So <laughs> but, but I, I'll, I'll mention one thing: Star Wars got right. Mm -hmm. I could, I could, if I looked hard, I might be able to find another thing. But uh, Episode Four, I guess. So the first one made. Oh. There's Luke on his sand planet or wherever he was. Mm -hmm. And he comes out and he sees a double sunset. Mm -hmm. It's a famous scene. And most stars you see in the night sky are double or multiple star systems. Oh. And we've always known that in astrophysics, but storytellers, science fiction writers never really much incorporated this reality into their, into their portrayal, in, into anything they imagined for a story they would tell. They did it there and they did it right. Because if the stars are too far apart, then the orbit of the planet becomes confused. And it can the, 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 the orbital allegiance constantly swaps between one star and the next, and a planet's orbit can go unstable very quickly and get ejected from the solar from, from the star system. But when the two stars are close together, as they were portrayed in that scene, then the planet can orbit a sufficient distance so that they both stars look to the planet like it's one source of gravity. Ah. And so it has one stable orbit around it. So I don't know that they did all of that level of thinking behind it, mm -hmm. but um, I, I, I'll compliment them for going there, if you will. Fair enough, yeah. fair enough. And that was and not- they, that was... And they, they made the jump to hyperspace first, at least the visuals of that, and then Star Trek copied it for their movie. We know this, so. <laughs> Uh, warp speed, yeah. That's just Star, Star you know, Star Wars hyperspace. So I, I don't, I don't want to take all credit away and give to to Star Trek. I mean, but they, they're both a fundamental part of modern American culture, and I'm good with that. Fair enough, fair enough, and that, that's a great answer too. And uh, obviously, I'm a fan of Star Trek, so so you had the right answer on that one as well. But that's good to know. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's good to know. That's good to know. Thank you, thank you. Now, start, I don't know if you saw one of I, I retweeted um, someone uh, who posted a photo of of the Star Trek landing party, and so it was it was Spock and Kirk and Bones, and then there's that other guy with the red shirt, right? And in this. <laughs> In this photo, Spock, Kirk, and Bones were all wearing masks. 
and the guy in the red shirt wasn't. <laughs> and it's like, that's the only <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> right. All I said, we know how this ends. Right, so, right. <laughs> and for those who don't know, the red shirts always die. So. <laughs> So that's that's what that's that's what that's alluding to, and that's great. And and interestingly enough, you you use that in your lecture in Chicago, where I saw you a month ago. That slide um, in Cosmic Collision. Thanks for coming to my to my public talk. Oh, it was fantastic. And I think one of the one of the great things you do before I actually dive into my actual questions here is um, I, I you do what I love to call nerd to English translation. In the <laughs> sense that, in the, you know, in the sense that you are making something very, very visible to the general public in a way that most people don't understand. I really try to do that in my day job in cybersecurity and all of that. But obviously, it's, you know, you have a much more complex uh, job. Although, as you mentioned, astrophysicists tend to label things very basically as opposed to geologists or, or anybody else. Yeah, we, we are simple people. And uh, in, this, in this latest release, Welcome to the Universe, it's a very small version of a much larger book that I wrote with two colleagues of mine based on the class we taught at Princeton, an introductory astrophysics class. It was basically a textbook, except it didn't have all the curriculum you might expect. It just had stuff we wanted to teach <laughs> that we enjoyed exactly. teaching that we thought was cool in the universe. And so the textbook, it reads a little more fun than your typical textbook but then that we made a pocket-sized version of it and in there i i talk about our language where we are simple people in astrophysics yeah. right the spots on the sun and we call them sunspots <laughs> that's the official right. term for them. <laughs> right the exactly universe began in an explosion we call that big bang that's right. what we call it keep it easy and keep, I, I yeah keep it the rest of the universe is hard enough I don't want to have to slog through somebody's vocabulary with Latin and Greek roots before I even get to the idea of what it is you're trying to communicate. And completely. And I, I, I totally understand that. And I think that that's what makes, I think, your work and your writing so approachable. And I think one of those interesting things that you mentioned in your lecture in Chicago, and it's something that I think we take for granted, which is essentially in the vein of my first question, is that you mentioned that because of Albert Einstein's just amazing work, we've been able to create by virtue of that, basically standing on his shoulders, more future Nobel Prize winning innovations like lasers. And you know, recently, you know, we discovered the Higgs boson in the last, I believe, decade or so. And so basically science and technology, from what I understand, builds upon itself to improve over time. And lately, obviously with the microprocessor, we've been accelerating that growth vastly. So my question to you is, are there any limitations here, if any, like what could stunt the growth or impede our progress as humanity just continues to innovate. And, and I'm very curious to know if you think there is a limit to, you know, to what we can achieve. Yeah, I would, I'm not gonna be the one who you look back on and say, oh, look how stupid he was. He, he thought we were at the limits of our understanding. I do enough reading of history. Uh, for example, in the year 1900, on a, there was a Sunday edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, and they had a whole pullout section on what the world would be like in the year 2000, right? So this is like a hundred years from now, right? And so someone who's head of the New York Central Railroad, by the way, in 1900, what was going on? We had airships crossing continents. We had steamships crossing the oceans. We had railroads. We had the internal combustion engine car had been invented. The design of the bicycle had been settled on. There were so there was a lot to, to, to be proud of coming out of the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution was making big machines. Uh, we were ready. We were ready. So this guy says, I can scarcely imagine that advances in transportation in the 20th century will be as great as they were in the 19th century. <laughs> and this, he writes this three years before the airplane is invented, all right? So I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to say that there are limits. What I will say is that yes there are limits to microcircuitry all right if you if you have uh, uh, electrical pathways that are sufficiently small and near each other because the miniaturization of electronics is an important feature of what it is to make them fast something that eluded any futurist from the 1960s such as the concept of how in the movie 2001 the the idea was okay if 
powerful computers are big, the really powerful computers are even bigger, right? So there's Hal occupying this whole section of the ship um, with his microprocessors. And it's like, no, no, that's not how you make a computer fast because the, the travel time of electrical circuitry through it can actually significantly impede uh, calculations that happen at a very rapid rate. So the point is, if, if you miniaturize it too much, what happens is the quantum wavelength of the electrons in the circuit become, they end up sharing a quantum state with electrons in an adjacent circuit. Hmm. And you can't have that. They, they need to be completely insulated from each other. So there's a physical limit to how small you can make this before the entire microcircuitry gets completely scrambled by quantum uh, um, coherence. And so a, a side branch of that is just quantum computing, where you know you have bits, your audience probably is familiar with this. Uh, your bits, we all know bits can have a value of zero or one, right. right? So bits are binary and all of computing is binary. Even if you don't know that intuitively or intellectually, you've probably heard it in your life, zeros and ones. Right. So right. the quantum computer is exploits the fact that in quantum physics, you don't have that level of certain information about anything, that there's a probability that an entity is one value or another. And so it's called a superposition. So you can have the superposition of a bit having the value of zero or having the value of one. And that superposition means it can be any value in between. Right. Okay. Statistically, any value in between. And so we call those qubits, right? Q-U-B-I-T-S. Actually, the jury's still out whether you just use a Q and a bit or a Q-U bit. I'm going with the Q-U just because I'm, I'm a literary guy. And I don't like looking at Qs without a U. It just feels, feels wrong. <laughs> so so but, in my own writing, I use Q-U for the record. So Thank you. Thank you. you. I wasn't going to bust your chops on it, even if you did. <laughs> didn't. But um, so quantum computing... Uh, exploits the very real quantum nature of the universe in the circuitry itself. So that would be an important leap over the computing that we're doing now. But what we don't know is might something be discovered in this century or the next that's a whole entire new other thing that exploits a new feature of the natural universe. I'm making this up, but maybe dark matter and dark energy, once we know what it is, that will empower us to do a whole other thing and open a whole other economy. In the same way quantum physics discovered a century ago, um, opened the entire world of the information technology universe. There's no creation, storage, and retrieval of information, right. digital information without the quantum um, at front and center in how and why that works. So, so I don't, I'm not given reason to presume somehow we're at the end of things. And given that, dark matter and dark energy are 95% of all that is driving this universe and we don't know what's causing it. It really doesn't sound like we're on top of the situation. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going with, yeah, there's probably more to come. Fair enough. And, and I would agree with you. I, I mean, I, I believe we will continue to, to progress as, as humans. I mean, that's just in our nature. We want to explore whatever exploration means, you know, to whoever's doing the exploring. But in the vein of my last question, one of the things that I'm actually driving at, because it's actually part of my day job, is that we've really seen a rise of anti-science and anti-education in the past few years. We have a huge amount of misinformation and disinformation that appears to be rampant online. So now we have to contend with, let's say, progress or anti-progress in things like vaccines. We have vaccine hesitancy. We see baseless conspiracy theories. Even the term research seems to be co-opted by certain people. And studies are showing that people are trusting like a Facebook friend posting whatever they're posting more than the due diligence that science analysis or scientific analysis is paying to verify information and putting it out in the public sphere. So in that sense, what do you think is the biggest issue we have in that context? So let me be a mild devil's advocate here and suggest that maybe anti-science is not on a rise or at an all-time high. It may be, but let me just offer an, another explanation here. It could be that such people were always out there. And now with social media and the internet, they can find each other and they can band together. And so they can have a louder collective voice 
than any one of them could have had as individuals. But I don't know if they're more, if you're counting absolute numbers today than in the past, or more as a fraction of the, of, of the, of the public. That's my first comment. Second, it's clear that if you have a full-grown adult who thinks Earth is flat, that, that's evidence of, I think, two things in this world. One, that we live in a country that protects free speech. So there you go. And another, that uh, we have a, a failure in the educational pipeline where people don't really know or understand what science is and how and why it works. So science, I think, has been taught, oh, here's a textbook, learn this, you get tested on it, and we're done. And nowhere is there the lingering understanding that science is a way of querying nature with methods and tools exquisitely tuned to prevent you from thinking something is true that is not, or from thinking something that is not true that is. And absent that training, you are susceptible to all manner of forces out there, leaving you to think that practically anything can be true just because it feels good to think so. Mm. So I don't know if these people have to age out and the next generation with a curriculum that does right by science uh, takes over. I do know mm -hmm. that the next generation is very climate change woke. And that means they're listening to the scientists. They have only known life with a smartphone and they know right. intuitively that a smartphone is enabled by countless thousands of science and engineering marvels right. that enable them to do everything they can and i have to remind my daughter for example that oh by the way you know your smartphone is also a telephone <laughs> we can call each other right <laughs> have you considered uh, that what? <laughs> what a concept <laughs> right exactly uh, exactly so so uh, i think it's quite a challenge and i ask i can ask it another way if this landscape of science educators did not exist, and I'm a part of that landscape, as are you, if it, maybe it would all be worse. So it, maybe it's not that we're bad at our jobs. It's that we're not appreciating how much better things are <laughs> for being, <laughs> for the work that we're doing. That's, of course, right. a self-serving comment, but um, to all of us who are out there with, in the blogosphere and and, you know, YouTubers and Instagrammers. Um, there are a lot of science educators out there who, who are doing homespun, interesting science experiments that are intriguing and have great personalities. And and so I think you have to keep trying. Yeah, no, and, and, and I would agree. I mean, and I would say of my own audience, uh, you know, especially on my radio show, because it's going out on NPR affiliates, those tend to be those that are interested in the sciences and, you know, listening to yeah, people pre like you and, for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it's a great audience to reach, but you know, as I'm, as I'm looking at this though, I mean, I, I, you're also sitting on a radio show that, that actually interviewed one of the leaders of the flat earth movement, like a year and a half ago to talk specifically about if social media didn't exist, you would still be like 12 people in a newsletter, not finding each other. You know, and, and it was an interesting conversation to see them. And my fear always with this is that, you know, as they put a, a, a rather loud voice out there, they continue to attract people that are simply not reading in or they've got a friend that says, oh, yeah, oh, this makes sense. And, you know, we've seen some famous people say, well, I'm not so sure <laughs> the earth is round anymore. And so those kinds of things, you know, uh, well, really Kyrie Irving was among them back yes. then. I think he was playing with the Boston Celtics. Yeah. And I, I think, I don't remember if I made this point online or just in a public setting, otherwise, you know, public talk. Mm -hmm. I just said, you know, Kyrie Irving, he's, he plays basketball. So yeah. I, I, it, I don't have a problem. Again, this is a free country. We're not here to control your thoughts. So it's, I, there are plenty of jobs for you in this world, if you think Earth is flat, <laughs> okay, he's he, he's not going to be a better basketball player if he then learns Earth is round. So I don't have a problem with that. What you want to do is keep people like that away from becoming head of NASA, for example. <laughs> that could be a major regressive force in civilization and in our culture. Uh, he would later, I think, recant, saying he just went down a rabbit hole, a YouTube rabbit hole, and he was never shown counter arguments to this descent, this Dante-esque descent right. that he uh, 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 
this hill cliff he fell off of and so but he would later sort of back pedal on a lot of what he had said as i understood that but so yeah it could bring in new followers i guess that that's possible um but so, so i don't know if it's actually more but it's mm. it's it, it's no less of a challenge for educators who are out there to address this misthinking people don't know what data are they don't know what it means to be an expert an expert is just whoever tells them something uh, convincingly rather than right. looking at uh, by the way advertisers know this right advertisers don't just show, show data and say here's why this car is better it's better on all these tables and all these graphs no they get somebody wow that car is amazing i was able to do everything i want and you're hearing the person the testimony without regard to the person's expertise what they know maybe they don't know anything about cars but you don't care because it's another human being sharing their emotional reaction to something that you then define to be the new truth and it's a shortcoming of our our capacity shortcoming of our interactions with others right and i, and I think oh. it's why we invented science to bypass that yeah and i i mean and i think that's a really good point in and in that vein, I, I actually have another question that is, is actually really similar, but it, it has to relate with science and actually what we just saw in Afghanistan with regime change. Um, and the reason why I say this is I actually did my fourth TED talk on that subject, on the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and the privacy- Fourth TED talk? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, I love them. <laughs> okay. They're fun, they're fun. Yeah, literally last week, last week, it'll be out It'll be out shortly. And well, congratulations, uh -huh. thank very you. important thank platform, you. yes. Yeah, I, I love it. And I think everybody should, should you know, engage in it in whatever way, whether you're listening or participating, whatever it is, I think it's a, a fantastic platform that's put out for the world. And I'm, I'm very happy I'm, I'm, I'm able to do those. Um, but basically, I, I talked about the, the, the Taliban takeover as it spells problems for their very heavily data mined population. And, and I'm going to science with this, trust me on this, because it seems like having an identity system outside of a government control would actually help quell the threat of having the information you post online be used against you by, let's say, a sudden regime regime change, like the Taliban taking over. And I don't think they're going to be the only country to experience that as we see democracy under threat. And we've got just great innovative platforms that are now coming up, like Human ID, for example, that's working on this problem. But I want to ask you the question and that in that and that backdrop, what do you see in this po current political climate in the West as the biggest threat to the national scientific institutions that could possibly go through government change? What if, as you mentioned, you know, we have free speech in this country, what if suddenly we didn't? Like, what, what would the research that science is doing, would it purely be a weaponization of things or, or would something else that we'd have to be concerned about as we are going through this? And a lot of people obviously are concerned for democracy in the United States, as well as, uh, you know, Europe, as we're seeing authoritarians attempt to rise. So I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on that. A couple of things. I think we overcredit free speech for so many things that we enjoy as Americans that actually have nothing to do with free speech. Okay. So, uh, for example, Russia beat us in practically every metric of space exploration until we landed on the moon. Hmm. All right. They invented the rocket equation. They had the first satellite. They had the first non-human animal, the dog Laika. They had the first human, Yuri Gagarin. They had the first woman. They had the first dark-skinned person, a Cuban. Remember, Cuba was part of the right. Soviet bloc, basically. And they were sympathetic to the communist universe. And so, so we, they're beating us at everything. And it's not a democracy. No, it's not. And they don't have free speech. Mm -hmm. And they're not free in the way that we valued here in the United States. Yet they were kicking our buttocks in technological advances. And so um, we like to think of uh, free speech as something that promotes science and engineering, whereas our uh, educational systems show up very low on international rankings of how well we do in our science and math um, uh, basics coming through uh, you know kindergarten through 12th grade not only that china has the world's largest radio telescope right now um, and ours just crumbled into dust the arecibo telescope look it up on youtube you can yeah. watch it collapse in real time by drones um where we where they 
They have the footage of the cable snapping and the main detector dropping into the dish. This was the largest telescope in the world for 60 years or so. And uh, China now has it so that aliens trying to talk to Earthlings, their first contact will be Chinese astrophysicists. Not only that, China has the record for the farthest distance between two quantum entangled particles. Huh. Right. Oh, but they have human rights violations and there's no really free speech and there's authoritarian and is it a dictator or is it a lead? How do you? So these systems are very different from us, yet it's not stopping their advances at all. Um, England, with a monarchy, made all manner of advances in science and technology coming out of the 17th and into the 18th century. A lot of it was militaristically motivated, of course, as you had hinted, but, uh, or said explicitly, <laughs> but um, so just because we have free speech is not alone the thing that makes this happen. What makes it happen is you need a system of government that cares about discovery, whatever is motivating them. And most of the time it's war, but it could also be economics. And it could be just because it's kind of cool. All right. right. The kind of cool money funded the Hubble telescope. Right. All right. That didn't that itself didn't have security value, although it was based on a previous model that did. All right. There were Hubble telescopes in orbit pointing down before the Hubble telescope that we know and love pointed up. Hmm. So so um, now that being said, let me make a dip. You need free exchange of scientific ideas. That's an aspect of free speech, right? I, but I don't think that's what people think of when they think of free speech. They think of you're out in the open and you want to say whatever you want. That's different from when I publish something, does everyone have access to it? Science cannot productively move forward without that kind of openness of what is discovered. And you could close it all off if it's secret or top, you know, top secret security. You could do that. Uh, sure, but you won't get the benefit of others who might be working on the same thing that could advance your results even faster or further. So science is a free and open exchange of ideas. That's how it works. If you go back a thousand years to uh, the Middle East, Baghdad, right in the center of the golden age of Islam, uh, you can say, well, what made that period in location and time so special? Well, Baghdad was a major trading center. And so Christians and Muslims and Jews and, and atheists, although I don't know how there might've been a different word for the non-believer back then, but anyway, everyone moved through those places and there was a, a, a big and beautiful library there. So it became a place where you'd exchange ideas, test, you, would, you would contest ideas. And if you do that in a way without killing each other, Every idea you have, if someone thought about it more than you, it, it rapidly advances and faster than if you are sitting at home alone in your armchair. And so great advances in, in, in engineering, astronomy, medicine, and especially mathematics rose up out of that period. Point is you can't just cite, we are humans. It's in our DNA to explore as a permanent and eternal reality among humans because our the the countries that actually do it first it's not all countries it's only a very select subset and not all countries do it for all of time and so you really have to look at the cultural political constructs of those times and places to see what it was that was valued by the leaders by the electorate or whoever was in charge of running the place mm. and were, was exploration and discovery a fundamental part of their portfolio because if it wasn't they would then be dancing to the tunes played by others or just simply regressing back into the cave because that's where you go if you stop advancing right well and, th and that makes a lot of sense i mean and even in your book accessory to war which i thought was just really interesting you know you mentioned that both archimedes and leonardo would have basically worked for their departments of defense Right when the telescope came about, it was an immediate instrument of war, 
And so there is, I think, in one aspect, as I was talking about the militarization of that, but yes, if you have the time, the money, the energy, and the effort in a government that really says, yeah, we want to do this, we want to get to the moon in a decade, you know, you can do it. You just have to have the effort for that. And I think that's just- Yeah, but, but, but let me just be clear. When we said, let's go to the moon in the decade, we had just witnessed the right. Soviet, Soviet Union right. just beat us at every, you know, get to space first. So this was a reactive posture that we took, not a proactive posture. Right. I have no doubt that if Russia were not threatening us, the godless commies, right? If they weren't threatening us, that we wouldn't have gone anywhere. We're not that organized. We're not that coherent in our responses right. to do things just because some fraction of the country wants to do it. But when everybody feels threatened, your way of life and all the rest, which is how communist was communism was portrayed as the great threat to democracy and to freedom and to peace loving um, nations around the world, then we responded. So all the front end rhetoric, uh, will do it, be not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Um, no task will be so and it was stirring, stirring rhetoric. But you part the curtains and behind there is we're at war. Congress, please write the checks. Okay, because we need this in order to maintain our self image that we are better than they are at everything. Right. You need that as the backdrop. It's not just the speech, the right. whole landscape right. has to support it. And like I said, in some other research I'd done appeared in a, in a different volume, the in the Space Chronicles book. Yeah, it's either uh, war or money. These are the two big drivers of doing very expensive things. The, the urge to explore and discover, I've never seen that win out over anything. It typically piggybacks the other exercises. Right. Well, and even the discovery of America was for wealth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, or, right. yeah, it was a so. quarter route to the, to the yeah. Far East. Exactly. So it, exactly. Uh, Columbus is looking for India, and he calls the new people he meets Indians. Right? Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is eh, you know, enough, this is, right? this like, is, that's his thing. <laughs> You know, yeah. if, if it weren't so tragic, it would be completely hilarious that right. this is how history played yeah. out, right? Yeah, and absolutely. The, uh, so, and the motivation, this was not, uh, Columbus did that before the Dutch East India Trading Company yeah. went around and made a buck, by the way. Yeah. Uh, because they would then learn where are the trade winds, where are the hostels, where are the friendlies, is there food there? What is, is there a marketplace? So the governments did things for geo hegemonistic reasons, right. geopolitical reasons, right. and so let's not, let's be honest with ourselves about that. That's why no one's no one's going to Mars, unless we feel threatened by someone else who is. Right, right, and you, and you mentioned that as well, uh, you know, in your lecture in Chicago, which I, I thought was great, and and just looking at the time, and I, I God, I wish I had three hours with you, but I don't. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to talk about your your latest book, A Brief Welcome to the Universe, pocket size edition, and uh, you know, can you can you explain to my audience all about that? Because I mean, you're writing. Yeah, so I've I have two co two co-authors on it, Michael Strauss and uh, J. Richard Gott the third. The three of us co-taught an introductory astrophysics class at Princeton University back when I was on the faculty there. And we really didn't want to teach the class because we had other things we wanted to do, but the class had to be taught. So we, we stapled ourselves together and because then we only had to teach a third of the class. <laughs> so uh, it was part laziness, but also part we taught the subjects that we were most enthusiastic about, or well, that's how we divided the, uh, the universe. And but we also did another thing. Instead of following a traditional curriculum, we just picked the coolest stuff we can think of in the universe and put that in the course. Oh. So, and then we were invited to write a textbook, which we did, but it was still kind of very conversational and very, here's cool, here's another cool thing, I'll tell you that. And this one intrigued me, I'll tell you that, all right? And that was, we wrote the textbook. And by the way, it has math in it, all right? But then the publisher, Princeton Press said, um, maybe this could, we can get a, like a pocket size version of this. So here we have a course that we taught where we taught only our favorite stuff. And that's what ended up in the textbook. And now we cherry picked the textbook <laughs> to put what's in the pocket sized edition. <laughs> and so, so this, I, you know, this is, this is like, this is intensely, um, uh, uh the book is in, in, in 
it has a level of in, enthusiastic intensity that may be rare in science books just because it's the stuff we love the most and you're going you are going to benefit from that uh if, if you check it out so that that's what it, it just came out just this month yeah no and I, and I think that's great and I, I know you always have stuff that's going on and, and your writing is just absolutely fantastic for those of my listeners or, or viewers that that haven't read any of your books I highly recommend picking them up you know including the the new ones are really approachable and I think honestly that's one of those things that that I just absolutely love about you <laughs> when I'm listening to you or you know listening to Star Talk or you know whatever it is I, I really do believe that when it comes to bringing science awareness to the general public I, I I'm, I'm not kidding I think you are going to be the shoulders that others will stand on in the future you are priming i think science is that be... my, why my shoulders are kind of droopy now, lately <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little bit but but yeah but but neil dr neil degrasse tyson thank you so much for joining me today and and uh if anybody wants to follow you or or you know connect with you in some way shape or form on social media uh what's the best way they can do that yeah it's all neil degrasse tyson you know at neil degrasse tyson mm -hmm. uh D D E G R A S S E, the silent E, except on Twitter, where back in the birth of Twitter, you only had 140 characters. And I said, I'm not blowing a whole eight characters on my middle name here, or however many characters at E G R A S S E, seven characters. So it's Neil Tyson at Neil Tyson on Twitter, where most of my communication with the public occurs when I'm not otherwise in, a, in the Chicago or theater. <laughs> right, right. And thank you. I, I knew we were the first on your tour. So I was very <laughs> yes, proud, yes, of that, yes. proud of that fact. But, but thank mm -hmm. you again. And uh, this has just absolutely been great. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.